Hi, everybody. So uh, I have my new microphone that just arrived in the mail today. Uh, it's a Bluetooth microphone that hopefully will bypass the microphone on this iPad. I listened to a demo on YouTube that I taped earlier today, and my voice sounds a little bit flat. It's not like a stereo microphone like the one in the iPad is. Uh, so it sounds like me on the phone. But I think that's okay as long as the audio is continuously recorded and you don't have any oscillations in the volume hopefully that you know this will be a little bit less distracting another nice benefit is is that you're not going to hear the tapping of the stylus on the screen anymore so it worked okay with the demo that I did before so we'll see how this one turns out and uh and hopefully uh it'll be a more pleasant listening experience so uh let's talk about physiology of the nephron. So what is the end product ultimately of a nephron? Well, urine, of course. That's the whole goal of uh, ultimately sending this uh, filtrate through this series of tubes that we talked about before. So before we generate filtrate, or I should say uh, a better way to phrase that would be in order to generate filtrate, uh, we have this process of filtration, all right? So with filtration, we are forcing fluids and dissolved substances through a membrane. More specifically, what are we forcing through the membrane? We're forcing the water and the dissolved substances of our blood plasma, right? And are we forcing all dissolved substances through the membrane? No, we're only forcing the small dissolved substances. You might want to emphasize that right here. So small dissolved substances are all of the dissolved substances within the water of our blood plasma. Those are the only ones that are actually going to get across this membrane. Large substances like proteins are not going to get across. And we're going to um, reemphasize that coming up quickly. So this is done by outside forces. We'll talk about that coming up shortly. Uh, water and solutes move from the glomerulus, which is that little tuft of uh, uh, capillary bed, into the glomerular capsule. So remember the glomerular capsule, AKA by the way, glomerular capsule is the Bowman's capsule. Is this like cistern surrounded by squamous epithelial cells that surrounds the uh, glomerulus. And so it acts as like the sink, so to say. Remember the bathroom sink analysis where you're wringing out the towel? Well, the towel is the glomerulus, and the sink that actually catches the water that you wring out of the glomerulus is your uh, Bowman's capsule. So the resulting uh, solution that you get through this process of filtration is filtrate. So again, it's very, very important that you know this. This filtrate should not contain proteins nor blood cells. So big things like proteins, or I should say more specifically, big molecules that are dissolved within the blood plasma like proteins, and then humongous things like the blood cells themselves cannot get through the porous membrane of the glomerulus. All right, so renal corpuscle, do you guys remember that term? Renal corpuscle is just a combo term. It's the combination of the glomerulus and its respective Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule. So the renal corpuscle is especially adapted for filtering. So let's talk about some different qualities of the renal corpuscle that make it good for filtering. It consists of a very porous membrane. By porous, we mean that it has holes in it but the holes are only large enough to allow only the small molecules in some of the water of the blood plasma to pass through. So if you remember that blood is let into the glomerulus through the afferent arterioles. Remember the afferent arterioles are coming off of those cortical radiate arteries. And then ultimately the blood is going to exit the glomerulus through the efferent arterioles. Well, it turns out in order to create kind of a bottleneck, so to say, of blood within the glomerulus, the efferent arterioles 
or the exiting arterioles have a smaller diameter than the afferent arterioles. So as a result of this, the blood pressure in the glomerulus is extraordinarily high. All right. And as a result of this high hydrostatic pressure, this is this force that we talked about before, this outside force that's able to push that uh, blood plasma through this porous glomerular membrane. And as a result, we're able to squeeze out some of the water out of the blood plasma along with some of the small dissolved solutes within that water. So also, it's important to know that this membrane contains glycoprotein. So remember when I drew out the podocytes for you, and the podocytes are kind of interdigitated amongst themselves and exterior to the walls of the capillaries? Remember I told you that in between the podocytes and the walls of the capillaries, we have all of these proteins. These proteins specifically are glycoproteins. By glycoprotein, we mean that they have sugars attached to them. And they have very, very negative charges. And because of these negative charges, they repel proteins, because proteins on the whole tend to have negative charges. So all of these massive blood proteins like albumin or fibrinogen, they all get blocked based on the negative charges of these glycoproteins that are wedged between the wall of the capillary and the podocytes with their interdigitated uh, foot processes. In addition to that, just the surface area established by the glomerulus is extensive because the glomerulus itself is made up of an extensive capillary network. All right, so all of these different features contribute together to make each little renal corpuscle a filtration powerhouse. Now let's talk about some specific uh, factors that are uh, driving this force of um, filtration, or more specifically, I guess a better way to say it is, let's talk about some factors that are involved in facilitating um, this process of filtration. So first of all, like we said before, the ultimate driving force of this is the hydrostatic pressure of the blood in the glomerular capillaries. So we're gonna symbolize this with HPGC, that is hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. So this is basically glomerular blood pressure. Remember we said glomerular blood pressure is very high because those efferent arterioles are narrower than the afferent arterioles. So you get this bottleneck of blood within the glomerulus which causes the blood pressure to go up, which is good because we want a high hydrostatic pressure in there to help drive some of that water and dissolve solutes through the porous, um, or I should say porous uh, filtration membrane. So again, this is the force uh, that a fluid under pressure exerts against the walls of a container. In this case, we're talking about the walls of the capillary. So we also have some forces that oppose this uh, hydrostatic force, which is the driving force of filtration. Now remember we said that the proteins don't escape into the filtrate, right? The proteins stay dissolved within the blood plasma within the capillary. So those proteins actually have an oncotic force that tends to draw water back into the glomerulus through osmosis. So we call this the colloid osmotic pressure, the colloid osmotic pressure. In addition to that, when we squeeze some water out of the blood plasma along with some small dissolved um, solutes to create filtrate, the filtrate starts to collect within the Bowman's capsule and that fluid will also press up against the walls of the Bowman's capsule. So you also have a hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. It's not as great as the hydrostatic pressure you have in the glomerulus, but it's still there. And it still factors into the big picture of how much filtration we're able to accomplish here in the renal corpuscle. So again, this is the pressure exerted by the filtrate against the wall of the capsule. So again, the, the two forces that oppose the outward flow of fluid to create filtrate are the colloid osmotic pressure 
uh, that you find as a result of the proteins within the blood plasma and the glomerulus, and then also the hydrostatic pressure that the filtrate exerts within the Bowman's capsule. So both of these pressures are going against our hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. So now finally, the overall pressure, which is your effective filtration pressure or the net pressure, all right, also sometimes abbreviated as the net filtration pressure, is going to be your hydrostatic pressure of your glomerular capillary minus the combination or the addition of your osmotic colloid pressure of your glomerular capillaries and the hydrostatic pressure of the uh, Bowman's capsule or the capsular space within the Bowman's capsule. So you basically just do your accounting board, you plug and chug the numbers, and that gives you your net filtration pressure. So for example, if the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries is 55 millimeters mercury, which is pretty big, by the way, considering you're dealing with a capillary, that's pretty high pressure for a capillary. Um, and the colloid osmotic pressure in the glomerular capillaries is 30 millimeters mercury, and the hydrostatic pressure within the capsular space is 15 millimeters mercury, what you're going to do is you're going to say 55 millimeters mercury for your uh, hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus minus a combination of 30 millimeters mercury for your osmotic colloid pressure within the glomerular capillaries, plus your uh, 15 millimeters mercury hydrostatic pressure within the capsular space. So HPSH. And when you plug and chug these numbers, let me make it a little bit simpler here. So 30 plus 15 is going to be what? It's going to be 45, right? So as a result, your net filtration pressure here is going to be only positive 10 millimeters mercury. That's not too much, right? That's basically your net driving force that's forcing some water out of the blood plasma along with some small blood solutes to create filtrate. Okay, so as a result of this net pressure, you're going to get the production of filtrate over a time interval, all right? And this is going to be your glomerular filtration rate or the rate in which you produce this filtrate. The amount of filtrate that you produce per unit time is another way to think about it. In a clinical setting, oftentimes the glomerular filtration rate is abbreviated as your GFR. That's how you're going to see it in the lab work. So again, the glomerular filtrate precisely is going to be the volume of filtrate formed each minute by the combined activity of all of your millions of glomeruli within both of your kidneys. Remember, these nephrons, all right, of which contain the glomeruli and the renal corpuscles, there's millions and millions of them in each kidney. They're microscopic structures. can't see them with the naked eye. So the glomerular filtration rate ultimately is going to be proportional to, that means how much uh, filtrate you can process or produce, rather, per unit time is going to be based on your net filtration pressure, which we just identified. That's the plus 10 millimeters mercury number. But also the total surface area, upon which filtration can occur. So remember, we said these uh, glomerular capillaries are quite extensive, which creates a vast amount of surface area for this process to occur across. Now, what happens with chronic renal disease, let's say as a result of hypertension, and you get a scarring over of glomeruli over time? So you lose thousands and thousands and thousands of glomeruli over the decades, and as a result, you will have less glomeruli, and also you have less surface area through which filtration can occur. So what's going to happen to your GFR? Over time, your GFR is going to drop, and that's exactly what happens with people with chronic renal failure. 
Also, you have to make sure that that membrane that is the composite of the walls of the glomerular capillaries and those podocytes and then the glycoproteins wedged between is intact. So if you have any diseases that cause that membrane to be destroyed, then that's going to break down this whole process of filtration. So you have to make sure that you have good filtration membrane permeability, which basically means that the membrane is porous. It's doing its job. It's letting small things through, water and some small solids dissolved in that water, but it's not letting the proteins through um, or, or the cells or, or anything that, that is too large to pass that barrier. Now, also, on the flip side, if the membrane becomes too thick, then it's not going to let anything through, and that's not good either. Okay, so overall, the adult kidneys are going to produce 180 liters of filtrate per day. That's the equivalent of 47 gallons, by the way. Um, now, this translates to a GFR of about 120 to 125 milliliters per minute. So that's a normal GFR. That's how it's calculated clinically, is the amount of filtrate produced by both of your kidneys, if you have two kidneys, uh, per minute. If you only have one kidney, then the GFR is just going to be the amount that's produced by that one kidney. So the glomerular filtration rate technically is measured by the renal clearance of a substance called inulin. Now, our body does not make inulin. Inulin is something that we inject into people, but it's inert. It doesn't have any effect on our body. It basically passes right through us. And so what they do is they inject the patient with inulin, and then they take blood at certain time increments after that. And what they're able to do is extrapolate from the amount of inulin that is left in the body over a certain amount of time, they're able to extrapolate the volume of plasma, that is blood plasma, from which the kidneys can completely remove the inulin. Yeah, I almost wrote insulin. Inulin, not the same thing as insulin at all. And so basically they can go back and this uh, clearance of inulin can serve as a proxy for your GFR. Now this is the most accurate way to calculate someone's GFR. However, on a regular basis, when you order your, your BMP and they calculate a GFR, what they're really doing is they're just measuring the patient's creatinine levels in their blood. And then based on their weight and their height and their age, they use a standard curve to basically go back and, and make a good estimate of what their GFR is. But just keep in mind, when you estimate the GFR based on someone's uh, creatinine levels in their blood, it is an estimate. It is, in fact, a crude estimate. The nephrologists are going to have to order an inulin clearance test to get a really good understanding of what that GFR really is. Okay, so now let's talk about these different processes that occur in the tubules of the nephron. So remember, remember that analogy that I gave you originally where you, you're taking the um, wash towel that's saturated with water and you're squeezing it over your bathroom sink. That's analogous to the process of filtration, the generation of filtrate. Then the filtrate collects in your sink, your bathroom sink, which is the Bowman's capsule. And then what do you have at the bottom of your bathroom sink? You have a drain, right, and a series of pipes after that. Well, those pipes are the same things as the nephron tubules, the tubules that we talked about before, right? So here in this picture, and by the way, you have the answers to this picture in your notes, so I'm not going to go over this, but this is what I'm talking about right here. So here is our uh, glomerulus. Here's our afferent arterial, right? The blood goes through the glomerulus and then out through the efferent arterial. And then here we have our Bowman's capsule. We'll do it in blue, B for blue. Here's our Bowman's capsule. The sink. And then right here, here's the beginning of our proximal convoluted tubule. We call it the proximal convoluted tubule because it's a little bit convoluted, right? It's a little bit twisted, as we see right here. And then the proximal convoluted tubule gives way to your 
loop of Henley, and then after you go through your loop of Henley, more specifically after the filtrate goes through the loop of Henley, it then goes through the distal convoluted tubule. And eventually, that filtrate makes it to the end of the line as far as your renal tubules are concerned, and it makes it into this big, long uh, pipe right here, which is kind of the equivalent of like a sewer stack in your house or an apartment building. This is the collecting duct. Once the fluid reaches the collecting duct, that is, once the filtrate reaches the collecting duct, it is now officially graduated and uh, should be recognized with the title of urine. All right, And that's how we uh, ultimately get urine, and then the collecting duct is going to take that urine to your renal papillae. Remember, the renal papillae are the little inward-facing tips of the renal pyramids, and then the urine collects in the minor calyces, and then flows into the major calyces, and then into the renal pelvis, and then ultimately into the ureter, and you know where it goes from there. All right, so that's the big picture, how all the pipes all fit together. So now what we're going to talk about is the physiological processes that are going on within these renal tubules. So let me switch back to red. So let's talk about the first process here, tubular reabsorption. So with tubular reabsorption, this is the movement of certain components of the filtrate from the nephron tubule or, or renal tubule, same thing, to the blood. So this is a reconnaissance mission here, right? We're taking back stuff from the filtrate that we need to get back into the body. So it's kind of a backward system where when we generate the filtrate, we get rid of everything we don't need and some of the things, or actually quite a bit of the things that we do need, we just get rid of it all. It's like cleaning your house by throwing everything out first and then taking back what you need from your front lawn, all right? So, but that's the way it works. So we get rid of a lot of stuff in our filtrate, but then as the filtrate passes along the simple cuboidal epithelial cells of the tubules, those cells are specialized for taking back the things that we want, like most of the sodium, all of the glucose, and a lot of other ions and substances that we need. All right, so um, the filtrate contains ions, nutrients, like glucose, and waste. And we want to take back most of those ions and uh, those nutrients as well. The wastes we can do without. They end up going down the collecting duct eventually, right, with the urine. So the nutrients must be returned to the blood, namely glucose. Um, now, remember I said that we generate about 125 milliliters of filtrate per minute. It's amazing that 124 of that 125 milliliters of filtrate ends up being reabsorbed. So we take back the vast majority of filtrate. We reabsorb the vast amount of filtrate as it passes along these tubules. So you got to remember these tubules are very dynamic. These aren't just lead pipes. We're taking back most of that fluid and a lot of the stuff dissolved within that fluid as the filtrate passes through. So ultimately, only one milliliter, which is tiny, tiny amount of fluid, actually is eliminated down those collecting ducts. And that's the reason why the collecting ducts are able to receive um, so many different um, nephron tubules is because by the time you get down to that end, there's not a lot of fluid left. All right. So by the way, this process of reabsorption is accomplished by both passive and active transport mechanisms. This goes back to AP1, right? Active, and, uh, active transport uh, mechanisms involve using ATP, whereas passive transport mechanisms do not involve using ATP. A lot of times, passive uh, transport mechanisms piggyback off of active transport mechanisms. All right. So let's talk about some of the substances that are reabsorbed and where they are reabsorbed. Now, luckily, you guys don't have to go into a really detailed accounting of all this, but if you took like a graduate level physiology course or even like an upper level 400 level course at UB, you really would have to go through all of these different segments of the nephron tubules or renal tubules and really learn about what's going on and what's not going on. So just count your blessings for that, that, that this is all we want you to know right now. And really, for now, this is enough. When you talk about or rather learn about pharmacology and you learn about how diuretics work, 
you might look at it in a little bit more depth. But th this is the level that we're going to go in it for now, and and that should be enough um, or, or suitable um, for uh, this level course. So in the proximal convoluted tubular, PCT, that's what that stands for, most water is passively reabsorbed here, including glucose, amino acids, sodium, and uh, chloride as well. Then when we get down to the descending limb, that is the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water continues to be passively reabsorbed, but you do not see the reabsorption of sodium or other solutes. Then when the, when the filtrate rather gets to the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the loop is impermeable to water, but then permeable to salt or sodium chloride. Now, why is this important? This selective permeability of water versus sodium chloride within the loop of Henle is responsible ultimately for helping us develop a gradient of concentrations of urea or a um, concentration gradient of urea in the fluid between the tubules, the interstitial fluid. And I'm not going to go into it any more than that, but this gradient is absolutely critical for our ability to form a hyperconcentrated urine. Do you guys remember the hormone that's responsible for uh, allowing our kidneys to form a hyperconcentrated urine? Remember that? Antidiuretic hormone, right. So in order for antidiuretic hormone to work properly, you need this gradient in concentrations of urea within the interstitial fluid between the tubules of the kidney and this differential reabsorption of um, sodium and water is part of that. And, and honestly, they don't even really understand how it works. I can remember one of my professors in graduate school after going through all the mechanisms of it, and it's a lot more complex than what we're describing here, said basically FYI, this isn't really the way it works. We don't know the way it really works. So stay tuned for that one. But anyways, that's the reason why we teach you that. Number four, distal convoluted tubule, sodium is reabsorbed here again. This is where the last little bit of sodium is reabsorbed, and this is through the actions of the hormone aldosterone. Do you guys remember good old aldosterone? Um, and then finally, collecting duct. Um, about 10% of water is reabsorbed here, and this is through the hormone of ADH. And remember, ADH needs that um, a gradient of urea in the interstitial fluid surrounding the tubules in order to work optimally, in order to form that hyperconcentrated urine. Um, and, and sodium is reabsorbed here as well. And then when you reabsorb sodium in the collecting ducts, and also this happens at the distal convoluted tubule as well, by the way, um, potassium is uh, actually kicked out or secreted. So the more sodium you reabsorb here, by the effects of aldosterone, the more potassium you kick out. Now remember I told you this way back when, one of the most important clinical pearls I can ever convey to you uh, is why a lot of patients in the hospital have low potassium levels. Well, a lot of patients in the hospital are on steroids. Um, steroids, usually, with the typical clinical use of the word, are artificial cortisol, right? Like prednisone, dexamethasone. It turns out that cortisol works on the aldosterone receptors by accident. All right, so as a result, when you give someone prednisone, you're stimulating the aldosterone receptors in their kidney, and as a result, that triggers a reabsorption of sodium here in the collecting ducts, but it also causes potassium to be kicked out. And when you, oh, didn't mean to do that. When you kick the potassium out, what happens to their blood potassium levels? They go down, and that's why you're constantly, if you're a nurse, you're constantly doing potassium runs on patients, especially you know, on the medicine floors when they're being pumped with a lot of uh, uh, steroids. Okay, so uh, I think that, uh, what else did we want to say? Um, this is regulated by aldosterone. Hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions are reabsorbed or secreted to maintain proper pH. So this is also going on here in the collecting ducts. We're uh, managing basically um, 
how much uh, protons or bicarbonate we want to reabsorb or get rid of to be able to balance pH. Remember, one of the most essential functions of the kidneys are, other than you know, filtration um, and regulating blood osmolality, are uh, also uh, regulating your blood pH. And this is how it's done here at the level of the collecting duct. And again, we're not going to get into any of the specific mechanisms of it. We just want you to be able to tie that particular function to this region of the kidney. Okay, so tubular secretion. Uh, basic definition, this is the addition of substances directly into the filtrate from the blood. So now what happens is, is because we have all this filtrate passing along in this big lazy river, so to say, of tubules, it's a good opportunity to maybe get rid of some things that we need to get rid of. Because ultimately, where is this fluid headed? It's headed to the sewer stack, a.k.a. the collecting duct, which ultimately is going to take it out of the body in the form of urine. So what happens is, is, remember, we have these peritubular capillaries and vasa recta surrounding these tubules. So we have a, a rich blood supply here in this region. So the cells that line the kidney tubules can actually take substances out of the blood, and really they leach out of the blood vessel into the interstitial fluid surrounding these cells. But they, they take these substances out, and they're able to then secrete them into the filtrate so they are eliminated from the body. Right? So these substances were not originally part of the filtrate. They're in the blood and they're being deposited into the filtrate as the filtrate is passing through these tubules. These substances were added from the peritubular capillaries and as I just um, gave away, the tubule cells. Uh, these substances include uh, um, uh, ammonium. This is the ammonium polyatomic ion right here. Uh, protons, which are symbolized as H+, right? They're just hydrogen ions, basically. And then also potassium ions. Also creatinine, which is a byproduct of creatinine phosphate. in certain drugs like, for example, penicillin, and also metabolites of drugs as well. Remember, this is a handy opportunity to get rid of different metabolites of drugs and or toxins from the body. Remember what I told you before, also creatinine is used as a proxy for measuring your GFR. So this is how um, we're able to tie creatinine levels in the blood to GFR, because the more filtrate that's passing through, the more creatinine you have the opportunity to get rid of. Okay, so let's talk about some basic properties of urine. Uh, normal concentration, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Normal composition, rather. Um, average pH of about 6, so slightly acidic. Uh, water is 95% of it. Uh, urea is going to be specifically a waste product of amino acid breakdown in the body. Uh, creatinine is a waste product of creatinine phosphate. You guys remember learning about creatinine phosphate when you uh, did muscle physiology in uh, AP1. Uric acid is a waste product of nucleic acid breakdown. So uric acid is different than urea. They sound similar, but they are different. Uh, substances. Also, urochrome is a waste product of hemoglobin breakdown. And it's the urochrome that actually gives urine its yellow color, at least is the major contributor for giving urine its yellow color. And then also you have an assortment of other ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, phosphate, sulfates, and ammonium ions. Anything the body doesn't need um, goes down the sewer stack or the collecting duct, so to say, as urine. Urine volumes per day it should be about 1.5 liters. That's important to know as a nurse. All right, but ultimately this is less than 1% of the of that 180 liters of um, uh, filtrate that is generated. So 100, 1% rather of what is filtered is a better way to say it. 
All right. So let's talk about your analyses, and then I think I'll have a separate lecture for the pipes, so to say, distal to the kidneys. That is the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. So urinalysis, significance of the procedure, is used to diagnose a variety of clinical conditions associated with the urinary system. So now what I want to do is just go over some abnormal urinalysis findings and, and what they're called. So for example, when you have high levels of protein in the urine, we call this proteinuria or albuminuria. Specifically, remember the most common protein we have in our blood plasma is albumin. So if you have a glomerular membrane, which is not preventing proteins from staying within the blood in the glomerulus, that is, the proteins are spilling out into the Bowman's capsule, eventually those proteins will spill out into the urine, be detectable in the urine. And of course, you're going to see a lot of albumin because it's the most common protein within your blood plasma. So that's where that term comes from. But some examples of causes of this would be hypertension, which would lead to high pressure within the glomerulus, which would cause damage to the glomerulus. But you also might see it with a condition known as glomerulonephritis. Whenever you see the uh, suffix itis, that means inflammation of the previous word, all right? So glomerulonephritis means you have inflammation of the glomeruli, all right? And that inflammation can cause damage to that membrane, causing the proteins to leak out into your urine. When you have glucose in your urine, which is never a normal finding, we call that glycosuria. And of course, you guys know that this is common with diabetes mellitus, right? One of the common ways in which diabetes mellitus is uh, diagnosed initially. Um, erythrocytes in the urine is known as hematuria. You can get hematuria with kidney stones. And this type of hematuria with kidney stones is not usually from the level of the kidney, but because you have the stones doing damage to the lining of the ureters um, or possibly uh, the urethra. Sometimes you, you might have kidney stones all the way up in, in um, uh, uh, your uh, calluses or renal pelvis of your kidneys, and, uh, and that also can do damage to the lining of those structures, causing hematuria as well. Uh, you may also have um, hematuria as a result of renal cancer or bladder cancer. If you have leukocytes in your urine, this is called pyuria. Whenever you see the root word pi, the first thing you should think of is pus. And basically what pus is, is just a lot of white blood cells, mainly neutrophils, in fact. All right. So you can get pyuria with urinary tract infections, of course. Urinary tract infections are usually bacterial infections in origin, but sometimes you can get um, uh, fungal infections as well which would have the same result. Uh, if you have ketone bodies in your urine, that's called ketonuria. Ketone bodies, by the way, are formed when we start uh, breaking down uh, a lot of fat by necessity uh, because our body has run out of carbohydrates, basically. So that's something that you actually get as a result of diabetes mellitus. Basically, what happens is is um, you have a hard time uh, letting the sugar into the cells, and so as a result, the body is not able to burn the sugar adequately, so it goes to the next best thing, which is fat. But the problem is, is when you start burning a lot of fat at the same time, you get all of these ketone bodies as a byproduct, and they start to build up in your blood, and eventually they can spill out into your urine and be detected there. Uh, bile pigments. 
if you see a lot of bile pigments within the urine, this is called bilirubinuria. So this usually results from having a buildup of bile pigments within the blood, uh, and this can happen because of liver disease, because the job of the liver is to break these bile pigments down. All right. Um, and, and by the way, the bile pigments are um, uh, from the breaking down of hemoglobin, ultimately. That's where they come from. Uh, you can also have obstruction of your bile ducts as well. And that's going to cause uh, the backup of bile. And you're going to have difficulty eliminating newly produced bile, and so those pigments are going to ultimately back up into your blood via your liver. And then finally, if you have hemoglobin within your urine, this is called hemoglobinuria, and this is oftentimes as a result of hemolytic anemia. With hemolytic anemia, remember the hemoglobin spilling out of the red blood cells because the red blood cells are breaking apart. And there's a lot of reasons why you can get that. Sometimes you, it can be an autoimmune reaction where your immune system actually attacks the red blood cells and splits them open. Uh, there's a lot of different causes for it, so we're not going to get into that pathophysiology. All right, so the next step is just the pipes that are conveying the urine ultimately to the exterior of the body. And that stuff is really simple, and I think I'm going to leave that for the next lecture. So I'm hoping that... Uh, this microphone is pleasant to listen to and that it captured the whole audio. Again, I think it makes my sound, or rather my uh, voice sound a little bit flat, but in the end, I think that uh, that problem compared with the problem of the sound cutting out and the volume getting really loud and then really low and you having to adjust the volume, um, uh, it's worth it to, to deal with maybe a little bit of a diminished sound quality to be able to prevent those problems from happening. So hopefully it works. All right, guys, I'll see you soon.